Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering two pediatric disorders that falls under GI disorders, and they're going to be celiac disease and cleft palate. So before we get started, please guys, like this video so you don't forget, you know you're going to love the video, so just press that like button now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So let's start with celiac disease. Look at what it says. Celiac disease, which is also known as gluten-induced enteropathy, a gluten sensitive enteropathy and celiac screw. This is an autoimmune disorder. Remember, whenever you see that word autoimmune, what's that telling you? The body's basically attacking itself. Okay. This is an autoimmune disorder and is triggered by ingestion of gluten in genetically susceptible individuals. So this is your key. What's the trigger? Foods that have gluten in it. Now take a look. It says the disorder results in permanent, not temporary, permanent intestinal intolerance to dietary gluten, which is a protein present in wheat, barley, rye, that causes damage to the villi of the smell of the small intestine. <clears throat> Excuse me. You guys need to know this. It's important that you know that patient that has celiac disease, guess what? It doesn't go away. They're going to have it for life. This is a uh, permanent. And what happens is they have um, uh, intestinal intolerance to gluten. Where's gluten found? You need to know it's found in wheat, barley, rye. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at the pathophysiology. Celiac disease is characterized by villous atrophy of the small intestine in response, again, guys, to the gluten protein. When individuals are unable to digest gliadin component of the gluten, an accumulation of toxic substance that's damaging to the mucosal cells occur. Damage to the mucosa of the small intestine leads to villous atrophy, hyperplasia of the crypts, and infiltration of epithelial cells of lymphocytes. All of those are bad. We don't want to see that happening. Genetic predisposition is an essential factor in the development of celiac disease. So the patient has to be um, genetically predisposed, okay? Now, clinical manifestations, what are those signs and symptoms we'll see in the patient that, again, guys, they have an intestinal intolerance to gluten? Symptoms of celiac disease appear when solid foods such as banana, or bananas, <laughs> such as beans and pasta are introduced into the child's diet between ages one and five years old. Other symptoms include failure to thrive, chronic diarrhea, abdominal distension, pain, muscle wasting, um, aphthous ulcers, and fatigue. Now take a look at this box. Very important to know. Look at these clinical manifestations. Statorrhea, that's fat that's found in the stool. Now, the thing is, you're going to see that stool is going to be fatty. It's going to be frothy because what's happening, that fat is not being uh, uh, um, absorbed and di digested the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so the patient's going to have impaired fat absorption. Exceedingly foul smelling stools from that unabsorbed fat. Impaired nutrient absorption. They're going to have muscle wasting, especially this is going to be prominent in the legs and the buttocks. We're going to see abdominal distension. And if the patient's in celiac crisis, acute. So something that happens immediately. It's not something long-term that we'll see little by little. Acute. Acute, severe episodes of profuse, watery diarrhea and vomiting. And it could be precipitated by infection, prolonged flu and electrolyte depletion, which means that patient is dehydrated or emotional disturbance. So those are important um, clinical manifestations. Look at the diagnostic test. Gluten should not be excluded from the diet until the diagnostic evaluation is complete so that proper identification can occur. So you don't just stop giving them foods with gluten until we do these diagnostic tests and we confirm that this is what it is. The diagnosis of celiac disease is based on, look at this, biopsy of the small intestine. Prognosis. This um, disorder is considered to be a chronic disease because the patient is going to have it for the rest of their life. Remember, this is something that's permanent. So it's a chronic disease. Most children who comply with dietary management are healthy and they remain free of symptoms and complications. Nursing care of the patient with celiac disease. 
help the child adhere to the dietary regimen because remember, they have to stay away from gluten. Although the chief source of gluten is cereal and baked goods, you need to know that. Grains are frequently added to processed foods as thickeners or fillers. To compound this difficulty, gluten is added to many foods as hydrolyzed vegetable protein, which is derived from cereal grains. All of this to tell us it is very important. You have to teach those parents that they need to read those labels very carefully. The nurse must advise the parents of the necessity of reading all label ingredients carefully to avoid hidden sources of gluten. Many children's favorite foods contain gluten like bread, cake, cookies, crackers, donuts, pies, spaghetti, pizza, prepared soups, hot dogs, luncheon meats, and some prepared hamburgers. I would know all of these for testing purposes. Breads, luncheon meats, and instant soups are not allowed. Dietary management includes dietary high in calories and proteins with simple carbohydrates, such as fruits and vegetables, but low in fats. Remember, we already have a problem with absorption of fats, right? Okay. Because the bowel is inflamed and as a result of the pathological process in absorption, the child must avoid high fiber foods such as nuts, raisins, raw vegetables, raw fruits with the skin until that inflammation has subsided. You're going to encourage your child and parents to find new recipes using suitable ingredients such as Mexican or Chinese dishes that use corn or rice. This has been seen on NCLEX several times, so you need to know that because it's not enough to say, hey, this is the problem. Don't eat this, 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 right? You want to be able to offer some alternatives. Oh, <laughs> that's our celiac disease. That's it. That's the most important things that you guys need to know for celiac disease. Let's move on to what was the second thing I said I was going to cover? Yes, cleft lip. There we are. Cleft lip and cleft palate. So cleft lip and cleft palate, these are facial, malf facial malformations that occur during the embryonic development so it's congenital guys and are most common congenital deformities in the United States. And below these are the different variations of the cleft lip and cleft palate that uh, the child's born with. Diagnostic evaluation. It's apparent at birth. Visually, you can look and see the cleft lip or cleft palate or both. It's very obvious. Therapeutic management. Multidisciplinary health um, team, pediatric plastic surgery will be on board. Orthodontics, I'm not even going to try. Am I going to try to pronounce this word? Of course I am. Otalolorin, you see it, this one right here. Lactation consultant, speech pathology. Although after that patient's had that repair, usually they won't need speech therapy, but they'll still be in, on board just in case. Audiology, nursing, social work, etc. cetera. Um, they'll get surgical correction of the cleft lip if it's cleft lip or surgical correction of the cleft palate if they have cleft palate. Nursing care, important things you got to know about nursing care. Parents of the newborns with cleft clefts place high priority on learning how to feed their infants and identify when they're sick, but they also express interest in learning the infant's normal features. So for feeding, if bottle fed, an infant with an isolated cleft lip can have greater uh, success using bottles with a wide base of the nipple, such as Playtex nurser or um, Nuke orthodontic nipple. Mother should be encouraged to provide the protective benefits of breast milk. This is always across the board. We always want to encourage breast milk first. Positioning, this is important. This has been seen on Anxlex. Make sure you know about positioning for that patient. Positioning an infant with cleft palate in an upright position with the head supported by the caregiver's hand or cradled in the arm. This position allows gravity to help with the flow of the liquid so that it's swallowed instead of lost through the nose. You want to have them upright. Make sure you know that. Suction is almost certainly impaired in infants with cleft palate. Infants with cleft tend to swallow excessive air during feeding, so it's important to make sure that you pause during the feedings and teach the parents to also burp, pause and burp, because all that air 
because um, that space, they suck up a lot of air and they'll cause them to have a lot of gas. So during the feedings, frequently they have to stop and burp the infant. Regardless of the feeding method used, the mother should begin feeding the infant as soon as possible. It helps with the patient's nutritional status and it also helps with bonding between the baby and the mother. Now remember, when it comes to cleft lip, cleft palate, the patient's gonna have surgery for correction. This is important. Elbow immobilizers. These may be used to prevent the infant from rubbing or disturbing the suture line, and they're applied immediately after surgery, and they can be used for seven to 10 days. Post-op, it doesn't matter what type of surgery the patient had, they're going to have pain, even the infant. So we're going to provide analgesia for the pain and to prevent restlessness. Again, patient's going to be... Um, they're going to be positioned in an upright position during feedings. Avoid, avoid the use of suction or other objects in the mouth. Think about it. They just had surgery, right? You don't want to do anything to disrupt that surgical site. So stay away from anything that um, can cause um, uh, suction in the mouth. They're giving you examples, tongue depressors, thermometers, pacifiers, spoons, straws, all of these can disrupt that surgical site. Parents are cautioned against allowing the child to eat hard items. Again, hard items also can disturb the surgical site. What are examples? Toast, hard cookies, potato chips. These can, these can damage the repaired palate. Long-term care, parents need to understand the function of speech therapy and the purpose and care of all orthodontic appliances, as well as the importance of establishing good mouth care and proper brushing habits. And that is your cleft lip and palate. Guys, let me know what you thought about this video. It was short, but it's to the point. I don't believe in fluff. I'm going to give you the meat and potatoes of what you need for testing purposes. So please let me know what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover or cover more extensively. And don't forget, guys, I also cover uh, nursing topics almost daily on my other so social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching, and you guys will catch me on the next video.